Circle of Magic, written by Tamara Pierce. Book One, Sandry's Book. Chapter One. In the palace of Black Swan Zaktan, capital of Hattar. Blue eyes wide, Lady Sandraline Fatorin watched her near-empty oil lamp. Her small mouth quivered as the flame at the end of the wick danced and shrank, throwing grim shadows on the barrels of food and water that shared her prison. When that flame was gone, she would be without light in this windowless storeroom. I'll go crazy, she said flatly. When they come to rescue me, I'll be raving mad. She refused to admit that, with this room locked from the outside and hidden by magic, a rescue was hopeless. I'll draw the mob away from here, far away, Prissy had whispered through the keyhole, speaking in her native trader talk. You'll be safe until the smallpox has run its course. Then I'll return for you. But her nurse had never returned. Right outside the door, the mob had caught and killed her because she was a hated traitor. With Percy dre- dead, no one would even know where Sandry had spent her last days. Her light wobbled and shrank. If only I could catch it in something, she cried. Like traitor wizards catch the winds in their nets. A net is string, she interrupted herself. And string is thread. She had thread in the work basket she had grabbed when Percy dragged her from her room. The basket's contents had kept her from giving up completely before this, as she embroidered until her eyes refused to focus. She had thread aplenty in coils and in her work. I'm no mage, she argued, resting her head on one hand. I'm just a girl, a noble girl worse yet. Like that maid said, good for naught but to be waited on and to marry. Good for naught, that's me. Tears filled her eyes, making the lamp flame quiver even more. Crying won't help, she snapped. I have to do something, something besides weep and talk to myself. She dragged her work basket over, fumbling. She yanked out three coils of silk, one green, one pale gray, one bright red. Swiftly, she arranged them, one in her lap, one to her left, one to her right. The light was down to a blue core and its wavering orange skirt. Gathering the ends of the threads in her left hand, she pulled them together in a knot, tying it as snugly as she could. Finding long dressmaker's pins in her basket, she pinned the knot to a barrel to anchor it. Her fingers shook. Sweat crawled down her face. She didn't want to think of what would happen if this didn't work. Worse, there was no reason for it to work. Parisi, the traitor and servant, had magic. Lady Sandraline Fatorin was good only to be waited on and to marry. Nothing to lose, she said, and took a deep breath. Nothing at all. Aboard the trader ships, their memanders, mages, called to the winds, as if they were friends who could be invited to stay. Come on, she told the dying flame. Come here, won't you? You'll last in these threads longer than you will in that lamp. That lamp guttered. The flame was gobbling the few drops of oil that remained in its bowl. The girl started her braid. The green thread wrapped around her fingers like a strangling vine. The gray slithered to the floor like a snake. The red tangled with itself. Uvumi! Patience. It is everything. Parisi had often told Sandry. Without patience, magic would be undiscovered. In rushing everything, we would never hear its whisper inside. Uvumi, Sandry whispered in trader talk. She straightened the threads, one on each side, one in her lap. Closing her eyes, she found that she was much calmer when she couldn't see her work or the lamp. She didn't really need to see, to do something as easy as a braid. In her mind, her threads gleamed brightly. They called specks of light from all around her and tangled them in her strands. The flickering lamp went out. She opened her eyes. The wick was dead and black. Through and around her braid, light shone steadily, filling the room with a soft, pearly glow. Did I know I could do that? she whispered. The braid light wavered. All right, she said, gathering the threads once more. But I have to sleep, you know. She wiped her eyes on her sleeve. With a whispered Uvumi, Sandraline Fatorin went back to work. In the southeastern pebbled sea. When she sat up and looked at herself, Deja thought she was a ghost. Her skin was all sparkly white. Had an enemy Mimander turned her from a brown trader into a white one? Why on earth would anyone do such a thing? She ran her swollen tongue over cracked lips, tasted salt, and grimaced at her own foolishness. This was no Mimander's doing. It was what happened when a sea-soaked girl went to sleep and didn't wake until the sun was high overhead. She brushed herself off, salt flakes dropping onto her makeshift raft. White grains got into her many cuts and scrapes where they burned like fire. 
Her family's ship was gone, sunk in a storm that their Memender could not stop or get rid of. The traitor god Coma, known for peculiar acts, had chosen Deja to be the only one left alive, floating on a square wooden hatch cover. All around her lay a spreading pool of wreckage. She saw tangles of rope and lumber, shattered crates, smears of color that were precious dyes from their cargo. Bodies also drifted there, the silent remains of her family. Deja's lips trembled. How long would it be until she joined them? Should she jump into the water now and end it? Drowning was quicker than starvation. Something thumped nearby. An open leather chest slammed against a mast. Again it thumped against the wood as water swelled, then flattened beneath it. She could just glimpse its contents, some bundles and dark glass bottles. It was what traders called a suruku, a survival box. They were kept everywhere on the ships. She had to get it, and she prayed that its contents weren't soaked or ruined. Deja reached out. The box was beyond her grasp. She looked around for a long piece of wood to grab it, with no luck. Water surged in another slow roll, and her raft moved away from the wreckage. The box stayed behind. No, she cried. No! She strained to grab that precious thing, though yards now lay between her and it. Come here! Come on! I, I order you! She half laughed, half cried to hear such foolishness. Come on, she whispered, as she had when she coaxed the ship's dogs to come to their food bowls. She was not very old, after all. She did not want to die. Tears rolling down her cheeks, she reached out and twitched her fingers as if she were beckoning to her pets. Later, she would wonder if she had just imagined it, being crazy with the sun and terrified of death. Now she stared, jaw dropping, as the box pulled away from the mast and floated toward her. It stopped twice along the way. Both times she wiggled her fingers, afraid to move anything else. Both times the box came forward until it bumped her hand. Very, very carefully she drew her prize onto the hatch cover. It was indeed a Siraku, lined with copper to keep the damp out and life in. The bundles were oiled cloth to keep their contents dry. The corks in the bottles had wax seals. Gently she felt through everything and grabbed a bottle. It took nearly all her strength to wriggle the cor cork out. When it popped free, liquid sprayed onto her face. Fresh water! She greedily drank most of that bottle before she came to her senses. If she guzzled it all now, there would be less for tomorrow. She had to save it. She fumbled to put the cork back in, inspecting the other bottles. She saw they also held water. Thank you, Trader Coma, she whispered to the god of deals and rewards. In the bundles she found cheese, bread, apples. She ate carefully in tiny bites as her lips cracked open and bled. All thought of the future had vanished, for right now she was gloriously alive. The Siraku lasted for three days and might have kept her for two more if she ate less than ever. In all that time she saw no sign of ships. It was still early in the trading season. Captains more cautious than her mother were still in port. Knowing her food was nearly gone, she tried to strike a deal with Koma and his wife, bookkeeper Oti. I don't li look like much now, she told them, her voice only a thin croak. But I'm a better deal than you think. I'm strong. I know most seamen's knots, except maybe the pinned sheep shank, but I'll work on that. She bit her lip. She didn't dare cry. It would mean losing water with none to replace it. Far away, so far that it didn't seem real, she heard the crack of canvas. Was it a dream? Slowly, she turned her head. She was in the trench of a swell. All she could see were the peaks of water on either side. Her nostrils flared. The wind blew as the trench she was in rose and flattened. New smells drifted into her nose. Breathing deep, she recognized the dull odor of brass riding on the back of the deep, rusty tang of iron. Metal meant people, didn't it? Metal, except for the bands on her raft and in the box at her side, went straight to the bottom without a ship to hold it up. Ahoy! A man's voice sounded over the water. Ahoy! Are you alive? Yes! Deja cried. She kept a hand on her beautiful Suraku. The other she stretched as high as she dared and waved carefully. If she fell in now, she was far too weak to swim. She lost track of time. It seemed like forever until she heard the splash of oars and saw a long boat come aside. In its bow sat a lean white man. His large dark eyes were set deep under thick brows and a heavy fringe of black lashes. He wore long silver and black hair tied back, a traitor to the bone, she noted, that his yellow shirt and gray breeches were linen and well-made, not a sailor's usual cheap wool. 
Hello there, he said, as casually as if they'd met at the marketplace. My name is Nico, Nick Lauren, Goldeye. I've been looking for you. I'm sorry not to have found you sooner. As sailors guided the boat closer, he reached for Deja and pulled her into the boat. Someone held a flask of water to her lips. Wait, she cried, voice rasping as she fought to sit up. My, my box, there, she pointed. Please, save it. The sailors looked at Nico, who nodded. Only when they had brought the chest into the boat and stowed it next to her did she relax and drink their water. In Hajra, port city of Sotat The first time the Hajran street guard caught Roach with a hand on someone else's purse, they tattooed an X on the web of skin between his right thumb and forefinger, then tossed him into a big holding cell overnight. Nursing his sore hand, Roach went straight to the far edge of the chamber, where a watery beam of sunshine reached down from an opening in the wall. Patches of cushiony moss grew there. Sitting on the floor, Roach found that none of them made a fine pillow. Mother, months later, a shopkeeper grabbed Roach as the boy helped himself to a few scarves. The Hajran street guard took him, tattooed an X on the web of his left hand, and tossed him into the same holding cell. The moss had grown to cover most of a corner. It made a soft couch where he could sleep and wait to be released in the morning. Roach's current visit was his third. The guard had nabbed his entire gang of street rats in a jeweler's shop. Most of them already had two X tattoos, which meant they got no third release from justice. All of them were thrown into the great holding cell. His moss now covered the entire corner and a good amount of floor as well. It was the most comfortable bed that he'd ever had, with room left over for the rest of his gangmates to use it for a pillow. As others scrambled for a share of the slop, the guard called supper. Roach whispered to his moss. I won't be back, he exclaimed. Third time's cursed. I'll get the mines or galleys or shipyards. Unless I break out, it's for life. He smiled faintly. Life was a short thing now. No one lived more than two years in those places, and escapes were rare. For all that, he slept well. When he woke, it was judging day in Hajra. Weevil, brayed a guard at the door. Roach's gangmate sat up. Dancer, alley cat, viper, slug. Roach hissed angrily. It was slug that got them all in this fix, watching them steal instead of looking out for street guards. Cheater, turtle, Roach. Roach hesitated. Should he make them come to him? A guard cracked a whip, looking at him. Roach decided to avoid the beating he'd get if the man had to drag him. With two X's on his hands, he'd receive plenty of beatings in the future as it was. Thank you he told the moss, and joined the rest of his gang. They were quick march past other cells, then up a long flight of stairs. On the level floors, the guard began to trot, urging the captives along with their whips. Roach was gasping when they were driven into a huge, echoing chamber. A woman in the gray robes of a magistrate sat behind a long table. People in street clothes stood in back of her. Clerks sat on each end of the table, scribbling as guards and civilians testified against criminals. Roach ignored the testimony that concerned his gang. These grand folk had already judged him, so why listen to their cackle? When the testimony was done, a clerk called out, Weevil! The gang leader was shoved in front of the judge. Hands, he ordered. The guard slammed Weevil's hands down on the table, holding them so the X-shaped tattoos were visible. Like Roach, Weevil had two of them. Mines, the judge said. A guard shoved Weevil into a wooden holding pen at the rear of the chamber. Roach shut out the rest as the law officers worked their way through the gang. Instead, he thought of those plants in the cell. How peacefully green the moss showed when even a tiny bit of sun touched it. Give him a green like that from a living plant over the light that danced in emeralds. That was a hard color. The moss glow was soft. The plant didn't seem to need much earth to grow in, though it liked water. He'd given it part of his water ration when no one was looking. He didn't mind being good to growing things, but he did object when others made fun of him for doing it. Twin pairs of rough hands picked him up, then dropped him in front of the magistrate's table, jarring his ankles. He growled and fought as the guards dragged his hands out in front of him. He knew it was useless, but he didn't care. They'd remember him, at least. The judge didn't look at his face, only his hands. Docs, she said, and yawned. They were dragging Roach to a separate pen from the one that held Weevil and Viper, when a light male voice said, A moment? It was not a request, but a command. The guards looked back. Roach did not. May I see the boy again? The man required. Bring him, the judge sounded bored. 
Roach was hauled back to stand in front of a civilian. This was no lawyer or soldier. His long, loose overrobe was a deep blue, dyed cloth that cost a silver penny the yard on Draper's Lane. It was worn open over loose gray breeches, a pale gray shirt, and good boots. He carried only a dagger. It hung next to the purse on his belt. This was a money bag, then, or an officer. Somebody big, for certain. Somebody who wore power like a cloak. The bag whispered to the judge who made a face. He held something before her eyes, a letter with a bare-boned seal on it. The judge glared at Roach, but nodded, and the bag stepped away from her. Their majesties are inclined to mercy, as you are but a youth. The judge rattled it off fast, a speech learned by heart. You have a choice, the docks, or exile from Sotat, and service at the— She faltered. The bag bent down to whisper, long, gray, streaked, black hair tumbling forward to hide his face. Roach wondered if he was looking for a cute little servant boy, and grinned. Men who liked play toys always regretted meeting him. The man straightened and looked around until his dark eyes caught and held Roach's gray-green ones. There was something in that black gaze, something that had nothing to do with human play toys. Roach's sense of power held in check grew threefold when he met those eyes. They warned and comforted at the same time. Roach looked down. You have a choice of the docks or apprenticeship to the winding circle temple in Emelon, the judge went on until you take formal vows at the temple, or until its governing council rules that you are fit to enter society. Temple or docks, boy, choose. Choose? There were guards on the docks, nasty, wary fellows. What temple could hang on to a smart rat like him? Better yet, Emelon was far to the north of Sotat, fresh territory where no one knew who he was. Temple, he replied. Make out transfer papers, the judge told the clerk. Master Nicklerin, this was to the blue-robed man, Will you take charge of him? Of course. For a moment, Roach's heart raced. He might be able to run before he ever saw Emelon. Then he met the bag's eyes and gave up that idea. The man, Master Nicklerin, looked too wise to fall for any dodge he might pull. I can't make out papers for a Roach, whined the clerk. Not to a temple. This is a chance, lad. Nicklerin's voice was light in tone for a man's. You can pick a name, one that's yours alone. You can choose how you will be seen from now on. Only as long as I stay, Roach thought. Still, the bag was right. Roach had never liked his name, but no one argued with the title the thief lord gave. Choose, boy, and hurry up, snapped the judge. I've other cases besides yours. The docks were too close to risk annoying these people. What name would temple folk like? Plant and animal names, that was it. He imagined robed men and women smiling at him and giving up the key to the temple gate. Plant and animal names. A picture flashed into his mind, a green velvet corner, but that wouldn't do. He needed a tough name, one that would tell folk he was not to be trifled with. He studied his hands, trying to think, and noticed scarred welts across his right palm, a souvenir of a vine that grew on a merchant's garden wall. What's them vines with needles on them, big sharp ones that rip chunks out when you grab them? The bag smiled. Roses. Briars. He liked the sound of that second one. Briar, then. You need a last name, the clerk said, rolling his eyes. A last name? wondered Roach. Whatever for? The judge tapped the desk impatiently. Moss, he said. No one would think he was moss soft if he just didn't use it. Briar Moss, said the clerk, and filled in the blank space on his paper. Master Nico, I'll need your signature. Briar frowned. Master was a word for professors, judges, and wizards. The temples called women and men dedicate. Who was this man, anyway? Cut him loose. The bag. Master Nicklerin, ordered the guards. Your pardon, sir, but you don't know what he's like, growled one of them. He's born and bred to vice. Nicklerin straightened and caught the man with those black, powerful eyes. Are these remarks addressed to me? Roach shivered. Was the room suddenly colder? The judge drew a circle of protection on the front of her robe. The guard's face went as white as milk. His partner cut Roach free. Briar won't run, will you, lad? Nicklerin bent to assign the clerk's paper. Briar Roach sensed that the bag was right. Something about this man made escape seem like a bad idea. I'll stick till we get to this temple place, he told himself. I can get lost there easy. In the city of Ninver, in Capchin. In the darkness of the temple dormitory, when she was trying to cry herself to sleep at the least amount of noise, Trisana Chandler heard voices. It wasn't the first time that she'd done so, but these voices were different. 
This time she could identify the speakers. They sounded exactly like the girls who shared the dormitory with her. I heard her very own parents brought her here and dropped her off and said they never wanted to see her again. Triss was sure about that one. It was the girl in the b bed on her right, the one who had tried to shove ahead of her in the line for the dining hall. Triss had raised a fuss and a dedicate had sent the girl to the back of the line. I heard they passed her from relative to relative until there weren't any who wanted her any more. Triss yanked at one of the coppery curls that had jumped out of her nighttime braid. She was fairly certain about this speaker, too, the girl whose bed was across the room and two more beds to her left. She had tried to copy Triss's answers to a mathematics question just that morning. The moment Triss had realized what was going on, she had covered her slate. She despised people who copied. Have you seen her clothes? Those ugly dresses! That black wool's so old it's turning brown. And they strain at the seams. Fat as she is, you'd think she'd eat more at table. She wasn't completely sure about the last speakers, but did it matter? The voices seemed to come from every bed in the dormitory to cut at her like razors. Why did they do this, the ones she'd never even spoken to? Because it felt good to be mean with no one to see and blame them? Because it felt good to sneer at the group did, go after the targets that their leaders pointed out? Her cousins were the same. They followed those who loved to make fun of the outcast among them like ducklings chasing their mother. When her parents had given her to the dedicate superior of Stone Circle, she had thought she'd run out of hurt feelings. It seemed that she hadn't, after all. Triss clenched her hands in her sheets. Leave me alone, she thought, speechless with fury and shame. I never did anything to most of you. Don't even know most of you. No one noticed that the wind had picked up, jerking at the shutters on the windows, making them clack against their fittings. I bet her parents tried to sell her to the traders. Maybe. But even traders wouldn't take her. They wouldn't think she has value. Everyone found this hilarious. One of the shutters hadn't been securely locked. It burst open, letting in a swirl of cold wind. The girls nearest to it screamed and jumped to close it. A gust of wind bowled them onto their rumps before it whipped around the room, pulling covers off beds, scouring belongings off the small shelves. By the time it roared out of the room, all the girls but Triss were screaming. Two dedicates their habits thrown on over their nightgowns, rushed into the room carrying lamps. Everywhere they looked there was a chaos of girls, bedding, and knick-knacks, except at Triss's bed. It was untouched. The girl in it stared at them with tear-reddened, defiant eyes behind the brass-rimmed spectacles that she had just finished jamming onto her long nose. The next morning after breakfast, they brought her down to the office of Stone Circle's dedicate superior and left her in the waiting room, Beside her they placed her few bags, completely packed. She had not said a word. There was no point in it. And by now she knew how stupid it was to try to talk to someone who was determined to get rid of her. As she waited, staring fixedly at those battered leather satchels, she realized that the honored dedicate's door was not quite closed. I know that you're already on your way to Winding Circle, and I need you to take this girl with you. Is that such a hard request to grant, Master Nico? Send her later in the spring when the trade caravans leave for Emelon. The light, crisp male voice sounded annoyed. I'm on a very special task these days. If I have to change my plan suddenly, this child will only get in my way. We can't keep her. Her parents swore that she was tested for magic and found to have none, but... The dedicate superior's voice trailed off. Briskly, she continued. I don't know if she's possessed by a spirit or part elemental, or carrying a ghost to be at the center of such uproar, and I don't care. Winding Circle is far better equipped to handle a case like hers. They have the learning and dedicates who are more open-minded with regard to unique cases. They have the best mages south of your own university. They will know what to do with her. Hearing all this, Triss felt sick. Spirit, elemental, or ghost-burdened was she? And what kind of fate awaited her? Some people learned to manage such creatures within themselves. Others got rid of them. Far too many ended up homeless and crazy, wandering the streets or locked up in an attic or cellar, or even dead. She swayed, feeling ill, and then clenched her fists. She was sick of it, sick of being gotten rid of, sick of being discussed, sick of not being helped. With a thundering roar, hailstones battered the roof and walls around her, hitting wood and stone like a multitude of hammers. They shattered the glass panes of the window in the outer office to spray across the floor like icy diamonds. Clumsily, she knelt to pick up a handful. The door of the dedicate superior's office swung open revealing a slender man in his middle fifties. He stood there, hands on hips, black eyes under thick 
black brows fixed on Triss. From the floor she glared at him, hailstones trickling from her fingers. It's rude to stare, she snapped, not over her fury. You were tested for magic? he asked, his clipped voice abrupt. Why did this stranger taunt her? Her family would have put up with her oddities if only she'd been proved to have magic, which might be turned to the profit of House Chandler. By the most expensive mage in Ninver, if you must know. And he said, I haven't a speck of it. The stranger turned and looked at the woman in the yellow habit behind him. Honored Renswing, I've changed my mind. I'll be very happy to escort Trisana to Wind Winding Circle Temple in Emlon. He smiled thinly and reached a hand to Triss. I am pleased to meet you, young lady. She ignored the outstretched hand. Getting up, she shook out her skirts. You'll change your mind before long, she retorted. Everyone does. In the storeroom. Carefully, Sandry eyed her rightmost thread. There was the knot that she'd tied close to the end. Time to put in something new, she told the waiting darkness with a sigh. She was all out of green now. It had given her good service, glowing with a clearer light than either the gray or the red. She would miss it. Yards of braid lay in a coil from which she continued to work. She fixed her mind on it and on the light completely, except for the times that she ate or slept, or used the stinking barrel that was her chamber pot. Keeping light in her threads took all of her attention, leaving her without time or energy for panic. She groped behind her for her work basket and froze. Muffled voices cried out on the other side of the wall. The girl swallowed hard. Had things gotten this bad? Was she going to start imagining people when they were not there? This way, dolts, a voice cried. Don't see anything. Someone, a man, growled in the distance. The light in her braid paled. Don't you dare, she ordered in a whisper. She couldn't keep her mind on it. The glow died. Breathless, she waited in the dark. If this was a dream, she wished it would stop. You won't see anything, a crisp, educated voice snapped. Its owner might have been in the same room with her, or on the other side of the door. It was spelled for concealment. She clapped her hands over her mouth and started to rock. This is it, she thought. I've gone mad at last. Something entered the room. A wash of cool air that wasn't really air, more a feeling of water than a breeze. Most of it circled over the empty sack she used for a bed. A lone thread spun out of that cool mass. Drifting across the room, it twined around her shoulders. Now do you see it? the educated voice demanded. I want the locksmith. You've got him, Master Nico. That deep voice also sounded very close. Metal scraped on metal. Air moved. She didn't know that the door was opening until it bumped her. Erda, bless me, what a stink, the deep voice said. Move aside, man, the crisp voice ordered. Its owner, a light-colored shadow, stepped into the room. My child, my name is Nickler and Goldeye. I've been looking for you. He raised a lamp that someone had passed to him. The light struck her eyes, which had been in the dark so long. Pain made her scream and cover them. She would see almost nothing for quite some time. 